Right, so the next step, of course, would be to set up a database for us. Now, you could, of course, set it up locally on your machine. So you could go ahead and install MongoDB and then wire it up to your app directly. You could also use Docker for setting up a MongoDB container on your system as well. But I think what I'll be doing for this tutorial though, especially because my operating system doesn't really support Docker yet, I'll be using a service known as MLab. Now you might as well be using something like Mongo Atlas, or as I said, you could even be using a local database. It doesn't really make any difference whatsoever. Your database could be anywhere on a local machine or somewhere else overseas on somebody else's server. It really doesn't make any difference at all. So for this tutorial, like I said, I'll be using MLab, which is a database as a service for MongoDB. It's very easy to set it up. You basically need to create an account with your credentials, your email and a password. It's very, very simple. So so I would leave that step up to you. But once you do create the account for yourself, you're going to be redirected to a page that looks something like this. Now for you, it's basically going to be empty because you won't have any databases set up yet. I do have a couple from other projects, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new database. What I'll do is I'll click on this create new button. This is going to create a new database for us. So I'm good with Amazon Web Services. Let's select a sandbox option. I'm going to click on continue. I'm going to select US East because I'm located in Canada, but you could basically select the one that's closest to you. Now clicking on continue, we can call it chat. This will be the name of our database. Continue. So everything looks good. It's all free. We don't have to pay anything. So submit order. This is going to take a bit of a second, a couple of seconds to create a database. It should be all good to go. So if I click on it, now we can go ahead and create a user. You're actually going to see a warning that we're missing a user. The user is actually required to connect to the database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on add user. In fact, let me go back to my editor. In here, we're going to go ahead and add a few other configurations. So I'm going to create a database username, and this would be the name for user. So let's say admin for the uh, database password. Let's do database password equals and this of course can be anything but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put in the database username admin I'm gonna paste in the password and create this is gonna create the user now once the user is created we can actually go ahead and copy the domain of the database we can also copy the port and of course the name of the database itself we could of course connect it to a shell so if we have a MongoDB client locally we could also connect it using that client so we can actually inspect the database, run some commands off of it. But we're actually gonna be using it for the application. So let me copy the domain name. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a database host. Let's put in the host for that database. We'll have a database port. We need to also copy it from here. And it's gonna be this second thing over here. And of course the last one will be the database name. And in this case, we call it chat. So I'm gonna use that name. And these variables really don't belong to this file. So I think what I'll do is I'm gonna cut them and paste them to a different file. Let's create a config.js file. We can paste those variables in and we can basically export all of them out of that file. We can now basically go ahead and import those vars on demand. We know that we need an app port variable, we need node environment, actually we need in prod. So once we have those two, we can import them from config. And of course, we're going to use the database variables in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch back to the terminal. Let me clear it out. What we need to do is we need to install a library called mongoose. As I mentioned before, mongoose is a MongoDB ORM, which allows us to work with the data using models. Now, of course, there is a native driver for MongoDB on Node.js, but using a library like Mongoose is basically going to simplify the way that we work with our data. So we're going to go ahead and use that library. So let me do a yarn add Mongoose. Once Mongoose is added, we can basically go ahead and copy these variables. We're going to use them to create a connection. So let me paste them in over here. And this thing could be on its own line like this. So going back to the documentation, Let's click on read docs. I'm going to switch to, let's say, schemas. I'm going to go ahead and try to look for connect. So there's quite a few ways to do it. One of them would be to pass the entire information. So something like the user and password info, as well as the database URL itself. Back in here, we're going to do an import of mongoose from a mongoose. So we're going to go ahead and set up a mongoose connection. So let's do mongoose connect. I'm going to be using backticks and we're going to copy the string from the docs. So we're going to use that as a 
reference. So let me paste that in. Now the first thing is going to be the database username. So let's do db username. Next up we have database password. So db password. Then we have the host. So this would be db host. We have a port. So let's put in a port. And last up we have the database name itself. So database name like this. And now the other thing we also might want to pass is an object with a bunch of configurations. We're going to go ahead and tell Mongoose to use new URL parser. So we're going to set that option to true. Now this function call is going to be asynchronous. So we can either chain and then on it. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a self invoking async function. So I'm going to put in a set of closing brackets at the end. I'm going to take all this code from there and put it inside the function. So this way we can actually use a wait on this call. Now of course this might fail and if it does we're going to get a nasty warning in the console referring to the unhandled promise rejection something like that so we can go ahead and actually do a try catch on it. So let's do that and if there's an exception we're going to basically do a console error on it. Now I'm not going to be using Morgan or debug or anything like that just yet. If we do find a reason to use them we can always pull them in but for now I'm going to keep it simple. So now to test the connection we can go back to the terminal we can do a yarn dev and if the connection was successful you're going to see the URL to our endpoint but if something went wrong you might have to go back and check that your connection string is correct. You may need to also make sure that you're passing the use new URL parser option to Mongoose. Now once we've done that we can actually go ahead and create a models folder. So this one is going to house all of the Mongoose models. So we can create a user model we can also create a not a folder but a file actually an index.js which is basically going to be an entry point to that folder. So we could basically export default as user from user In this way we can go ahead and inside of user we can actually have a an export default of something so we're going to figure it out in a second but first of all let's do an import of mongoose from mongoose and so we're going to create a constant let's do user schema so what we need to do is we need to new up the schema so let's call it on mongoose that schema we can pass in an object the first object is going to be the definition for our schema once again this is going to be pretty much identical to the type definition so we can actually pull it up and display it on the right side we're going to have a list of the same exact fields so things like username and created at in fact let me just copy everything from here and i'm going to put it in over here now as far as the types in mongoose the types could be something like string, number, could also be an object ID, which is a special type, but in this case we don't have to define an ID. The ID is going to be created for us implicitly. The other thing we could do is we can actually provide an object in here. In this way we can have a more customized field. So for example, we could set the type to string. It's going to be the same as setting the value itself to the string. But we can pass in a configuration object. We can also supply options like let's say required we could set it to true we could also set up an option to trim for example this is going to trim the white space from our values we could also set up some validation rules things like min length for example the email must only be of length for example six and in fact you could also pass in an array you could provide a custom message like email must be at least six characters you get the idea and besides there's also an option known as unique now this one trips up a lot of people. Actually, unique doesn't necessarily do what you might think it does. So for instance, in SQL databases like MySQL or Postgres, if you set a unique constraint on a field, it's going to make sure that you can't have two records with the same value for that field. So if we do that for the email, it's going to ensure that the email cannot be duplicated. Now in Mongoose, it's a little bit different. The enforcement is actually set through a unique index. So this unique property is actually a shortcut for that. So you can actually go ahead and do something like user dot insert many and you can insert an array of multiple user objects with the same email. So because the index for the email field has not been updated yet, you could still technically insert multiple users with the same email. So this validation is not really strict or not really precise. So we're going to be using a different mechanism 
for it just to be safe. And in fact, I won't even use something like required because there's several places where we're validating our arguments. So what I'm talking about is we have an implicit argument validation inside of our schema. So for example, if we're calling a sun app mutation, we already have a basic validation as far as the types go. So for instance, the email field has to be a string. So it can be something like an int or it can be a Boolean. So it must only be a string. And GraphQL will also validate that the email field is also required. So it cannot be something like null, for example. So this check for required, well, we might as well leave it off because the validation will be happening at GraphQL level. We're also going to be doing a bunch of custom validations. So things like minimum length or maximum length or validating the password field, for example. There's quite a lot of custom validation that we want to incorporate into the app. And doing all of it inside of Mongoose is actually quite cumbersome. And Mongoose does have a, quite a few limitations. So for example, the validation will not happen automatically when updating a record. And you actually have to pass in the option, so you have to be explicit about validation. And we already saw the unique property, which doesn't necessarily behave the way that you would expect it to behave. So we're gonna keep it simple for now. We might come back to the schema in the future if we want to add some more database oriented checks. So for example, to check if the username has not been taken yet. So we might actually add some custom validation afterwards. But either way, we're going to talk about that extensively in the validation video or section. So for now, we're going to keep it very, very simple. And in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and call mongoose.model. And we can assign this a user string. This is going to be the name for the model. And the second argument will be the user schema, of course. Now, the last thing I'll do is I'll pass in a second object to the user schema. So be careful about the order of the arguments. The first one defines the schema. The second one passes the options. As the options, I'd like to set the timestamps to true. This way, we don't have to define the created ad field ourselves. It's going to be added by Mongoose. So this one is going to add created at as well as updated at fields implicitly. And of course, they're going to be updated as the model is being updated itself. And now instead of the created at field, we're going to define another one. This one, of course, is going to be the password. We're going to store the password in the database. But once again, we're not going to be exposing it through the GraphQL API. We're going to be taking it as an argument to the signup mutation but we're not going to be exposing it to the public. It's only going to be stored behind a server in a database. 